could do it, but okay. we're good. Thank you. Thank you so much. All right. So we're now being recorded and this won't be sent to any legislators or <laughs> can't play it in your classroom, but yeah, welcome back. We're super happy that you're here. And uh, I think we just wanted to start to see if, um, you know, maybe go around and get a, a little uh, temperature of the room, <laughs> sort of see what people are uh, feeling or thinking about um, any anything that you want to share about um, a takeaway from the last couple of sessions or something that you would want us to focus on a little bit more today. I know we want to talk about open science, but we also, in the spirit of open pedagogy, want to know what the what the class thinks too. So um, <laughs> I'm gonna I, I, when I do this, I always just like go with the people that are on my screen to make it more efficient. So I'm gonna start with Laura. Oh, I'm just here and back again because I'm not a STEM teacher, but I'm learning so much from this and meeting so many great people. So thank you. And yeah, who do I see on my screen? I see the great Veronica. Okay. Veronica, go next. And just again, a kind of a takeaway, a lingering question. If you're there, this is where the... Okay. So sorry, we have a dog house guest who wants us to know anytime there's any movement in the neighborhood. Okay, <laughs> session one, here's what I took away. The need to critically examine uh, the systems that we have in terms of our ideologies related to science, the fact that science is an ideology and cannot be escaped from. Session two, the, the Rios um, rubric for evaluation, which I plan to disseminate widely within my field. And thank you so much for that. Thank you. Now, are we popcorning? Let's popcorn. Oh, can I, I I'd like very much to, to call on uh, Aaliyah. Hello, everyone. Good to see you, Veronica, and everyone else. Uh, it's great to attend the third session here related to STEM. I, like Laura, do not teach STEM, but it is interesting to learn what it's all about and how we can integrate it more and more in the education systems we're in. And similar to Laura as well, I'm here to learn as usual, of course, and to meet new people. Networking and socializing is one of the things I love to do as well. So glad to be here. Thank you. Thanks. I love that there are non-STEM people here. We were just talking last time about the, the real need for interdisciplinary integration, right? So uh, Trisha, you want to go next? Sure. Um, my biggest takeaway after having met with Amy this morning, who we are co-teaching a querying STEM class together in a couple of weeks, uh, uh, I think inspired yeah, is my biggest takeaway because we're going to try some of this stuff with ungrading um, and procreated syllabi and um, shareable that the students produce at the end of an outcome of all this good stuff. So just excited to try new stuff. I can't wait to hear more about that class. I'm totally, totally jealous. <laughs> I'll popcorn it over to Matt, because that's my brother's name. Well, hi, everyone. Um, I guess I'm thinking about at least two things. Uh, first, I'm thinking about, um, I think it was Brian's comment or point yesterday that, um, you know, I guess I, I felt I felt motivated. I felt pushed to think about ways to to measure what's happening in my classroom. It's just something that I tend to not, you know, I just tend to be about dealing with dealing with the day to day and 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 thinking about how I can provide the best educational experience. And I do I do work like beyond my classroom, but it I don't know I, I tend not to think about the data collection part and measuring things. So I've been thinking about that the past couple of days. And then um, I guess like, I think it was question, I don't have it up three or four yesterday, which was like, is something, uh, I'm getting it wrong, but is inclusion enough, you know? And and I, I guess I kind of just keep thinking of this, this balancing between sort of the, the, the list of inclusive practices and thinking about, you know, who's, Who's able to participate? Who who's welcome and who belongs? And and if not, what can we do? And then these like bigger you know structural issues and how to be attentive to both of those at the same time um, is is a lot. Um, 
I'll call on Heather. Um, yeah, I mean, I missed yesterday's session. Unfortunately, I was busy touring our state house with my Girl Scout troop. So we had a lot of conversations about, you know, our state name, which included Providence Plantations and stuff. I thought, like I thought they voted to remove that. They did. Okay. But we were in the state house where the carpets and the seals and everything is still very okay. much set up that it still mm -hmm. says the state of Rhode Island and Providence Plantation. So it was fun to have those conversations with our littles. Um, but, you know, my takeaway from Monday's session, um, and I have to sit and watch the recording from yesterday, because obviously, just based on the few people that have talked about it, I missed a lot, um, <laughs> is that, um, you know, I, looking at the list that was put up of like things that you can do for student agency and seeing a lot of the things that I already do on there and being like, okay, yeah, I'm doing the right thing, but knowing that there's always more and to, to start shifting from individual to systemic and how to relieve barriers for people that are interested in doing this or hesitant to do this work and how to how to keep getting that message going. Um, and I'm assuming that yesterday, if, it, if Matt was talking about data collection, I mean, like that's one of the best ways to start getting those um, conversations going. Um, so I'll have to watch that video. <laughs> and I'm gonna popcorn over to Rebecca. This is my worst nightmare. I'm terrible at things like this. Um... <laughs> I think that, but this is a brave space, so here I am. I think that one of the takeaways for me is continuing to like realize how much personal work is involved in this, and that was in one of the kind of one of the Brian's readings from the first day of like that I really have to examine, like kind of like Veronica was saying, like the structures that I've sort of bought into and kind of think about whether those are actually helping everyone. Um, yeah, thank you. And um, so I think that's what's coming up a lot for me. And I think the other way that comes out is like choosing to like, I'm going to not care about my course evaluations if I try this thing and, you know, whatever happens. Um, so like thinking also like just in my own head, like what are the kind of structures that are maybe making little barriers for me that I'm not really realizing? Um, that's what I've been and, and everything that everyone else has said. <laughs> I will, I would love to hear from Amy. Hello, thank you. Um, <laughs> uh, some of the things that, oh, well, I'm a non-STEM person as well, so I'm just happy to be in the space. And um, yeah, it's like co-teaching with Trisha, and we're really excited about our course. But there are some things that um, Brian said yesterday, and I had to write it down because he and I and it's like I know it, but I forget it. So similar like what Rebecca was saying, like it just sort of like teaching is not an apolitical act. <laughs> um, and so there, um, one of the things that Trisha and I talked about today was, um, and this came from our discussion yesterday, was failure and talking about our failures and also intent and impact. And so leaning into that in our class um, this year of like not canceling people and um, respecting that people have different perspectives, but also knowing that we have to have conversation and dialogue around that um, and that and how do we do that and then just Trisha and I really kind of modeling to like our mistakes and how we come back from those mistakes as well. So I think like everything that you guys have both said, Karen and Brian has been really impactful. And Karen, I'm really excited to go look at more of that Rios Institute as well. I'm, I'm, I'm like, I am a big fan of open pedagogy. So um, anytime I can work with instructors and bring um, and get rid of the textbook and bring in um, other sources, I think it's really powerful and impactful for students. So thank you both for that. Oh, I got to pick a person. Sorry. Um, Anna, have you gone yet? Okay. Hi. <laughs> I apologize for the noise. My name was, what's the name again? Um, I have been thinking about this a lot, and I think, <laughs> I don't know, uh, lately I've been thinking about kind of really big. Um, we had that quote in the first session to 
that critical pedagogy can move us away from toxicity and towards liberation or our students. And um, my grad school environment was pretty toxic. And um, and just looking over like the last 18 years of teaching, I think I've sometimes also created milder versions of that toxicity just by, I guess, being so indoctrinated in that whole system. And, um, and way back when, in one of the sessions with Rissa, she brought up a quote of bell hooks of how, uh, you know, an open college education is like our best hope for democracy. So I'm not really thinking big on this lately. Um, and I think for me, it's a little bit of a, you know, I'm still feeling burnt out and I'm going to be back in the classroom in two weeks. And, um, to feel like that it is really important work and, and that it, you know that it has a lot of meaning for the students and but also maybe like a, a bigger meaning. I think that's hopefully something that can inspire me to to keep going, even though I, I still do feel burnt out. And I think some of that came up yesterday too when um, Karen was talking about the social justice principles that come along and that was like that new table that had all those principles. So I'm not thinking small, <laughs> I'm thinking big and it's all like, yeah. So that's why I'm at. Thanks, thanks, and I am gonna call on oh, Karen. Me? Yeah. <laughs> I feel like I talk a lot already, but Gosh, yeah, I, I feel like I could amplify everything that everybody said. And um, uh, someone was just talking about the, uh, somebody said something that reminded me of, um, you know, calling people in instead of calling them out. I don't know mm -hmm. if you're familiar with uh, Loretta Ross. I'm just going to put, I was looking her up, but she's a, a brilliant um, writer and speaker who talks about calling people into conversations instead of calling people out on their shit, you know, so it's just uh, kind of brilliant. So that that just came up for me. And so I'm, I'll, I'll be talking so much more. I'm going to, I'm going to pass it along to Thea. Thanks, everybody. <laughs> Sorry, I'm just kind of jumping in. Um, gosh, so how has um, I missed the first session, but yesterday's session was just like really, really impactful to me in terms of um, just validation and like kind of support that there's other people doing this. And it's, um, I immediately jumped on um, OER Commons and I am in engineering and um, it is, there, there is frightfully very little in the way of open materials for engineering. Um, so that was a bit of a, a shock yesterday afternoon, not necessarily a shock, because I, I, I was kind of expecting it, but just to see how little there was for college level engineering was really, really disappointing. So it's a little bit of like, I'm overwhelmed <laughs> in terms of like, um, what needs to get done. But it's also just been really nice to have, you know, this, um, these sessions where there's also where there's people who are like minded and you know believe in empowering students and giving students voice. Um, I I got a lot out of Karen's suggestions of um, having students you know um, look at that content and um, be able to remix it and make it open and you know just ways that that the students can also be part of that uh, that movement. Great, thank you. Let's see, maybe uh, Danielle? Hi, uh, I wasn't able to attend the first session, but I did watch the recording of it and I was there yesterday for the second one. Uh, I'm coming in from the perspective of an instructional designer for the trades. Um, and my background is in physical chem. With my current work, the sciences are applied. Um, so what I'm interested in looking at is um, methods of open education that are specific to the sciences. Uh, we've got the creation of OER, Wikipedia articles and things like that. 
but I wonder if there are more specific things to the sciences that could be examined. Um, and perhaps this falls into that, that category, but if, you know, problem-based learning, project-based learning, perhaps in an open way by openly licensing the, uh, the work, though I'm not entirely sure of, I question the value of publishing you know, for its own sake and its influence on learning. So the fact of publishing openly doesn't, for me, hold value in learning in itself. So I do question that part a little. And then with regards to equity, just because something is open and the students are doing the work doesn't mean that equity is being applied. So my concerns there are, what if you have a team uh, where, you know, it's the underrepresented students that once again, uh, don't get to, aren't fully included or you get someone who is extremely confident though wrong and trying to push the team in a certain way. Um, it's STEM courses. So what if you have pre-med students and they're competitive and they're concerned about a group project? Um, so, uh, and also what if you have students with learning disabilities and if the shift is put onto the students to learn from each other, um, I have a bit of a concern for the students who have learning disabilities, particularly because it's been observed anecdotally, I'll have to say anecdotally, that uh, more and more students in, in the courses at my institution do have different types of learning disabilities. Um, uh, and then we've, we've talked about equity in the classroom and you know using open pedagogies in the classroom, but there are interactions in greater spheres, like with the rest of the institution and with uh, organizations outside of the institution as well. You know, politically, we see that there's influences, at least in the States, and that exists in other countries too. So uh, I think it's important to, to look at not only the classroom, but all the other things that affect um, from outside as well. Thank you. Great. Thank you for all that. There's a lot there to <laughs> unpack for sure. And uh, Heba. Yes, hello everyone. <laughs> uh, first of all, I would like to thank you all for the spirit, the positive vibes <laughs> uh, I'm having because of you all. Uh, actually, I felt a lot, uh, a lot of support from you <laughs> uh, in this challenging situation, uh, especially when you talked about uh, the, that there would be resistance or that some other uh, instructors are facing struggles with students as well as me <laughs> in a classroom. Uh, it gave me a lot of confidence actually. <laughs> uh, and I like the idea of um, changing the perception of the office hours that students, they don't have to come to the office itself to ask about the question. You can change the location, you can uh, just like uh, mm -hmm. have a talk with them about uh, what they are uh, what they are struggling in the course or how you can help them not they have to come to the office itself at the location and to admit that they need help from you <laughs> to give them the help they need thank you so much great thank you thanks for that and uh shahinas if i'm saying that correctly i apologize mm -hmm. if not Shahinez, are you able to unmute today? I know the other day you it wasn't easy for you to do that. May not be able to. Yeah, I should have said people are allowed to pass too. <laughs> too late, Rebecca. <laughs> well, um, Shahinez, I don't know if you can hear us. If you can't speak and you want to type something in the chat, that's fine. I'm not sure if Shahinez was in either of the two sessions. I don't remember. Okay, all right. Um, but I'm just gonna put a couple of resources that I liked from the two sessions, one from the first session, one from the second session. Um, I, you know, a lot of the talk, uh, the conversations are so valuable. And then the resources that help you go back and talk to people who don't normally agree with you is so important. Is the allyship being here discovering that you're not crazy is important <laughs> but then going back and talking to the people who do think you're crazy <laughs> in a different way to, to help them come on you know come and uh, both in terms of recognizing the value of, of this for for things that they value and not the things that we value um, and at the same time also then um, I love the idea framework and how it breaks things down and and how it makes it more accessible so once someone decides okay I do want to do this how where do I start 
I really like that uh, document. So thank you. Great. Thanks for that, Maha. And the idea framework is still undergoing revision. There's a whole working group uh, at Rios that are still working on refining that. Uh, thank you, everyone, for all the uh, additions. And, you know, Maha mentioned other resources. Uh, all of the resources uh, will link on the slides that you've been looking at, like in the comments area. And I'm going to openly share that whole slide deck with you after today. And we kind of get everything in there. <clears throat> I also noticed that when I went back and looked at just five minutes of the recording from yesterday that the chat stays preserved as well. And I believe even the links in the chat you can get to. So Brian, you didn't get to go, did you? I didn't, I felt excluded. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm, I'm, I'm kidding. I was. I would have been fine not going, but I, I wanted to just make two quick comments. Um, one was to uplift a little bit, um, you know, what Amy shared earlier about, um, you know, calling in and then you you mentioned about Loretta Ross. And maybe just a quick point on that. I think a lot of times, especially in, in faculty development or in, you know, just ways in which we do our work, there's this an implicit assumption without being intentional about it, that when you go through a process, the outcome is is victory, right? There's, there's something good, either a gap gets closed or everybody comes to the, the, the well and drinks. But Difficult dialogues is a little different. <laughs> and, and, you know, if like Maha says, you go back to your campus and you are having that conversation, um, sometimes it may take a few fractious interactions before you get to a place where you can just dialogue reasonably, right? That the goal can be to make that person not vote for the party they're voting for. Like, you know, maybe at some point in their life, things might change, who knows? But the way we measure these kinds of interactions, what you get in the difficult dialogues can be the same way you measure things like active learning or you know, how much clickers I use. This is a human activity, it's full of nuance, it's full of you know, stop starts and in-betweens. And if, if you're brave enough to go into that space to have that difficult dialogue, know that that typically comes with emotions that will come up that, that either you're not proud of or make you feel you know, very uh, uh, discouraged and, or, or things you'll hear that you don't wanna hear. Um, this isn't not to like infantilize it, but this isn't child's play. Like right? it's 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 necessary and important work, but it's it's definitely the difficult is there for a reason. Um, the the other quick thing, uh, just to Daniel, all the things that that they brought up that I thought were really really useful. Um, I, I, the whole time Daniel was listing all these concerns, I, I felt like I would wish you, Karen, and her would go somewhere and have like four hours of coffee, right? Because I feel like you have really good responses to each one of those concerns. I've heard you talk about those things in your talks, in your writings, you know, in Rios. Um, and, and maybe this is just to say that, like, unfortunately, we won't get a time, chance to fully unpack every concern uh, she raised. But if, if that's something that you can follow up on with us, Danielle, or, or be a part of Rios, believe me, these are all those things we are thinking about them actively, right? This is you know, we're not just, oh, just do open and everything will be fine. Like everything you raise is something we, we speak about intentionally, usually led by Karen. So I wanted to, you know, make sure that that's clear. Thanks, thanks for the time, Karen. Oh, no, thank you, Brian. Thanks, thanks for that. And it is so true. You, real, real quick, Karen, can you type your email in the chat, Daniel? Ask for oh, absolutely. <laughs> yeah, you know, you can, uh, you can uh, Google me too. I'll just put my, uh, oh, I never know which one to use. I have three these days. <laughs> Uh, and and uh, Brian, for sure, because uh, this is certainly not me. Like he said, I can answer all these questions, but there's a lot of other people that can uh, do an even better job of trying to address all this. And that this is what we talk about building a uh, community to do together, because not, not one of us has answers to addressing these really difficult problems. And so trying to build a network, trying to build a community, trying to grapple with this together. Um, is really, you know, what we're trying to do. And, th and that's why we're here today as well. So thank you for all of that. That's a really wonderful conversation. Um, if you if you are all okay, I was going to uh, talk a little bit about open science today and what, you know, how that connects to what we're doing in the classroom. And um, uh, I, I was going to share my screen with your permission. And again, somebody just 
interrupt me and say, we want to talk about something else if you want to talk about something else. Um, and this idea of towards a pedagogy of open science, because I know a lot of people have like heard of open science, and we certainly know about pedagogy and maybe a bit more about open pedagogy since we've been talking about it. But I've been working for a number of years actually trying to bring more coalescence to these two ideas. Because, um, you know, beginning with the idea of, well, what do we mean by open science and like open science just being for scientists and, and scientists doing it? Like it's 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 sort of generally defined by just being. Um, completely transparent in your methodology, observation, collection of data, however you do science. And I know some of you here aren't scientists, but you certainly understand the scientific process enough to know what we're talking about here. Um, so just putting all your data out there, putting things out openly on the web, putting your methods out there long before publishing it, um, putting data out there publicly available, use, reusable, what we call interoperable, so other people can take it and use it and analyze it. Um, public accessibility and transparency of scientific communication, so open access publishing, putting everything, everything out there that's not behind paywalls, um, using web-based tools to facilitate scientific communication. Uh, this isn't necessarily an exhaustive list, but these are some of the um, central ideas of what it means to do science openly. And, and we'll, we'll spend a little bit of time talking about some of the pros, but also the cons of what might come up around this, because um, I think there are lo lots of things that kind of came out, especially around COVID-19 and people feeling, oh, well, you know, um, we'll forget about the title. Uh, <clears throat> actually, let me come back to that. When, when COVID when COVID hit, you know, and people, we need to develop vaccines. Well, let's all have major companies go into their own corners and see who can get a patent quicker to make the most money because we know we're going to need a lot of vaccine development. But in fact, there was a lot of sharing of data and a real need as this huge, you know, global health crisis and people coming together. And there still was a lot of um, not sharing and wanting to be the first in Pfizer versus Moderna and all this other. Um, but the, the the, the idea that science could be more collaborative and people could actually share and that the idea that scientists do scientific work in order to learn something, in order to produce knowledge so that other people can have it and use it and lead a better life, like that ideal often isn't really realized in how we do uh, science. Those of you that are been in the scientific world know how extraordinarily competitive it can be how it's superstars in the scientific world that get all the recognition, who's got the most number of publications, are you gonna get scooped if you, you don't publish it soon enough and somebody else does and you don't get credit for it anymore? Like where did the idea that producing scientific knowledge and data for the benefit of the public good, where did that just get um, completely lost? Um, and so I, I feel like there, there are so many advantages. And, and in fact, um, actually, let me stop this share. I'm going to go over to, uh, and I put this as a reading on the website as well. This is something that I just copied from a class <laughs> that I teach because I think the idea of teaching students what open science is and kind of learning what it means for ourselves is is a way to get at some of these kinds of things that we're talking about. Like how, how do we think about teaching STEM? What does it mean to teach science? What does it mean to not just teach the content which we've been interrogating for the last couple of days, but to teach the process of science, right? And so how do, how do you do science? And who do you do science for? I think is a really important question. Is it for you and your personal gain? You know, is it for your local community? Is it, is it for the government in order to be a wealthier nation now, you know, or is it actually for the people, you know? And, and so I think in its ideal, the idea of transparency in science uh, comes with the idea that there's all of these advantages. And I don't know if this is too small on your screen, but you can click to the to link there too, that right now science is much slower and wasteful because it's locked away. It's ruled by commercial interests. Just, just try to get a grant for something that doesn't connect back to a commercial interest somewhere. Um, questionable research practices, a number of people that actually are um, so pressured to publish that they may fake data and there's just a lot of issues with the 
questionability of, of data and the re reproducibility of their data. But the idea that if people do science together and are trying to do it for the idea of solving some of these incredibly difficult problems that our planet is facing, that, that open science potentially could increase our range and extent of knowledge. And, and, I, and I love this phrase, it's, somebody else wrote this, the idea of amplifying our collective intelligence, because no one person's going to think up how to do this. Right, like, and and I think about cognitive diversity. We talk about human diversity and bringing different perspectives and the way that people look at the world, the way that people think about how to question something. Like, imagine a true um, sense of cognitive diversity with the true set of goals for actually attacking problems. We actually can solve global climate change. Like scientists have the technical capacity because it's like just stop making so much CO two, but you know, how we actually come around to doing this work is is, is really the tricky piece. Um, the real kinds of breakthroughs that could come through come from diverse teams of collaborators, not individual superstars. Um, there's declining funding. Uh, there's, I, I won't read all of these, sharing, sharing data openly, open research, uh, people who publish openly are cited more frequently. Students expect things to be open and free. This is an interesting one. <laughs> openness can be the sunlight that helps identify unethical behavior. And so there, there's a number of um, uh, possible uh, advantages, again, in, in an ideal world, in a, in, a, in a world where we can actually, you know, enact these things. So I want to come back to this because it's kind of interesting. This just, just came out this month. It's just, just a couple of days ago. Uh, Spark or sparkopen.org, you can go to their website, which is a major open education organization. And this came as, to the member update list uh, where the Biden administration signaled in most direct terms that it believes open science is a key enabler of scientific progress and equity. And what's, it, what's interesting, and if you click on this, it takes you to this office of the president, right? This memo marks, marks the first time a US administration has shown support for open science in its budget policy priorities. The, the memo specifically notes that public access to research outputs, including both research data and publications, can address cr critical inequities, specifically in underrepresented or underserved communities. So, so it feels sort of hopeful, right? Like the government's on board with open science and really wants to be able to do things um, and I know, you know, if you're like me, you're always like, this is awesome. And also, hmm, you know, is that going to actually <laughs> do science for the people or, or, you know, is it going to be about something else? And so, you know, this is where the pedagogy of open science, this is like where when we teach students how to do science, I think we really need to teach students why to do science. And, and again, who to do science for? W what is the point of learning things and addressing the kinds of questions that come up in our research practices um, if, if it isn't to actually benefit people uh, at large as opposed to individuals and corporations and governments. And so we can do this, you know, we can do this because we're teaching students how to do science. This is an example from an animal behavior, animal behavior class that I teach and having students do research projects and each of them keeping their own open science student notebook, which links to a website where all of their data is put. And of course, you know, they're just students doing projects. They're not putting out earth shattering data there, you know, but they're, they're practicing it, you know, in the way that when you're in kindergarten, you practice something like, what does it mean to put something out there and how all the other students in the class can read your stuff and comment on it. And this is where it's like, it's called collaboration, not copying or cheating or plagiarizing, like take my stuff and use it. <laughs> and, and you can say, oh, I, I got this idea from somebody else in class. And so I'm, now I'm gonna do my project this way. And I'm not copying you or looking over your shoulder or cheating or stealing your idea. I'm learning from your idea. And we're working on this collaboratively. And that what we come up with, we've done this in a shared cooperative way and that what we produce, we produce together. And it's not about any individual. People worry so much about group work. If I put my students in a group, how am I gonna, how am I gonna grade who does what? 
Like, just like, stop worrying about who does what, like, how does the group function together? And then if they all, everybody gets all an A, like, the, you know, the grades have to stop driving what we do because that drives the competitiveness, which leads us back to the superstar idea. And that that's where we can start dismantling how we're teaching and why we're teaching and what we're teaching for. Um, open data, which is a critical part of the open science movement, is rich with opportunities for teaching students to address critical questions. There are, so, there are you know, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of data sets, open data sets. Uh, I just threw this public art installations in the city of Baltimore, like the kinds of questions that you can ask about, like, why are these art installations here and not there? You know, they're just su such opportunity. Um, and but but we have to really think about our data sets and, and thinking about data science and how we teach students what data is and who has access to it allows us to also ask the questions together with our students. Who gets counted in our data sets and who's missing? You know. Is data dri driven decision making benefiting the public or does it actually amplify inequities in some way? This datafication idea. So, you know, our students are learning how to collect data, how to analyze data, how to use data. They need to be critically thinking about that use of data. Surveillance capitalism and the data economy. How is our data used? Who has control over it? Who's profiting from it? When we start early with our students <laughs> in this work of the construction of data and the collection of data, instead of let's wait till they all become major research scientists and data scientists and try to backtrack and say, oh, don't do it that way. I think that we're doing some of the most important work in the world by teaching students how to be scientists and how to be data scientists. Um, I created this image, which is the idea of thinking about the open ecosystem because open science doesn't exist out there alone and OER doesn't exist out there alone. And um, this idea that there are relationships between OER, which can actually um, feed your ideas and your courses for open pedagogy when you're teaching them, that you can use open data as OER in a class. You can use open access published articles as an OER for, date for, for your classroom and you're both modeling that open access articles are really a good thing and the fact that you can use them to help drive your processes of teaching open science. So these lines, somebody asked me, why don't you have a line between this box and that's kind of stylized, like I didn't think of every possible error that there could be here, but, um, and I love this book. This is um, uh, from Data Feminism, uh, Teach Data Like an Intersectional Feminist. And it's a brilliant, brilliant book. You should like read every chapter of it. And the authors, Catherine Dignazio and Lauren Klein, asked this question, what if we imagine teaching data as a place to start creating the connected, collective, caring world that we want to see? And, you know, you have your students out there and they're collecting data and they're asking questions like, is the lottery good or bad for your neighborhood? You know, and so you're learning how to do t-tests and you're looking at linear regression and you're talking about how to construct a graph that visually represents this, but you're you're teaching a lot more than that when you're asking critical questions and you're asking how does that data actually get at those questions and what are the questions that we should be asking? That that's how you teach students to think like scientists is like not just how do you answer the question, but how do you ask the question and who are, who are you asking the question for? Um, and so this is just my final slide of a reminder of things that we were talking about before and that Brian brought up earlier, that data is not ideological neutral, ideologically neutral, science is not ideologically neutral, education is not ideologically neutral. So even if you think that this is too much work and you don't want to do it, you know, you, you kind of have to because if you're, you're enacting some kind of ideology by avoiding talking about it too. So, so sorry, that's the bad news too. But it's, you know, this I think is really um, exciting uh, work that we have in, in front of us and that uh, the possibilities for teaching about open science open up and connect to all of these other kinds of uh, questions that we've been talking about. So I've been, uh, I'll stop yakking for a little bit and give you all a chance to respond or ask questions if you want. And um, we have some questions that we'll put in the chat and do some breakout rooms, but I'm happy to let us talk a little bit before before that. We're all like... 
I don't know what to say to that. <laughs> Laura, his hands up. Okay. Well, you know, I've got to ask about those student notebooks and what platform you were using for that and how that worked, Karen. That looked brilliant. Oh, sure. Yeah. Um, it's just uh, using Reclaim Hosting, you know, using WordPress based uh, websites. And we had a Reclaim a Domain of One's Own account for Keene State. And so I just have a website up there. If you if you go to my KarenCanch.net and click on classes, you can find your way to the animal behavior class and then you can find your way to the student notebooks and um, some of them are still there, I think. So here's back. Yeah, other other questions or? Karen, can you maybe respond to Matt's comment about too much handholding? I mean, there was a question mark here. So in, is that in the chat? Yeah, clearly he was okay. in a state of wonder when he typed that. So um, maybe just oh, a, I was, I a was, reflection. Sorry, yeah, yeah. I was referring to my own, like like Laura had given some advice about just letting students choose their own blog. The, the choice of the platform has always like, has always stuck, you know, been, been a problem for me. And then mm -hmm. it's feeling like, oh, I need to like, you know, set it all up and show the students how to do it and and have all the answers. Whereas Laura just says, choose a blog platform and use RSS. And so, um, yeah, that was my my comment about I, I'm maybe I'm doing too much hand holding. Yeah, I think that it's there's a propensity to want to do the hand holding and show students exactly how to do everything because they're going to be like, I'm lost and I don't know how to do this. And you're like, OK, let me show you. And and there are a lot of platforms like I used to just use WordPress.com, you know, and so. And actually, the less that you tell students and the more that you're kind of working it out with them, the, the more they figure stuff out and they're in that you don't have to be an expert in everything. But I, I used to use WordPress.com and literally take about 15 minutes to say, OK, this is how you sign up and it won't cost you anything and you will get some ads on your site. But, you know, and then we went to reclaim so that we didn't have to have ads, but it works kind of the same way. But the students were very adept at sort of figuring it out. And somebody's writing here, let students help each other. You know, we would have great fun in the classroom just having their computers and everybody's working on their site and something. Oh, I just figured out how to put this widget in there. And so that I know we can go down the rabbit hole of talking about technology and domain sites, but um, and that's just one way to do it. There are other ways that you can you can do it. So yeah, other uh other kinds of questions. Because we could, should we should we do breakout rooms for a little while, Brian? Or so we we have uh, let's see, twenty seven minutes to, um, till we'll say goodbye. Um, maybe pop the prompt ah, pop the prompt questions in the chat, say that ten times, um, and give us about ten minutes, ten to twelve minutes again. Okay, that sounds good. So um, these were the prompt questions, which are like thinking about what are ways that you can see to integrate open science or open data or open access into the classroom. Um, sometimes people uh, confound these terms. I, I use open access to mean open access publishing, like journals either having, there's green and gold, there's a whole rabbit hole of that. But, um, and then do you think the benefits of open science? Uh, because actually one of the things that um, I forgot to get to <laughs> is the pitfalls. Like. Um, there are there are problems with this too, in that open science isn't a panacea, right? Just like open education is not a panacea. And if you'll actually, if you'll just bear with me for a second, um, I'm gonna I'm gonna share my screen back to that same site that I wrote for my students under like let's do this, but how, and then some explanation about this. But then I wrote open science is not a panacea. There are concerns that need to be addressed, right? Like compensation for people putting in the labor. Um, open science can exacerbate current system inequities. It can be abuse of women and scholars of color. Uh, the vulnerability of sharing not good enough data, that can be much harder for some people than others. And there was that article I linked, like broken science, like there's like privileged white male scientists that are bros can do this, but not everybody who has doesn't already have that kind of um status but but that, that's why i think when you start with students we're, we're we're in a different place um open data can jeopardize data sovereignty 
um, indigenous rights to uh, information and data and, and properties, um, and needing to hold practitioners accountable to an IRB standard for human subjects research um, that may be a bit more difficult in an open environment. Um, a preprints are in an anything goes environment, a lot of labor that goes into sorting. Um, undergrads can't work as fast as a postdoc, so students could get scooped. Again, this idea of being scooped kind of comes up. So these are just concerns that people have raised. You may think of other concerns. And so um, if I maybe what I should do is I stop the share here and put the link. It, it's, it's on the website, too, and maybe you have a chance to look at it ahead of time. But you can look at these sort of pros and cons as you as you think about those um, questions uh, that I put in there, which are do the benefits of open science uh, outweigh some of these costs and what needs to change so that science and data can truly be open to the benefit of everyone? And, and how can we as professors of science students actually try to help create that world? So I'm going to I'm going to put the questions in there again um, and then we will. Uh, We'll go to the breakout rooms for about 12 minutes or so, if, if everybody feels okay with that. Okay. Uh, Karen? Yeah. Can you uh, repost the questions just because there's a lot of chat since the questions? Okay. So just, just so it's at the um. Whoops. I thought I did, but I forgot to hit the return button. Okay, thanks, Matt. He did it too. <laughs> It's like, I know we're all getting really good with the Zoom. <laughs> we took us two and a half years. <laughs> <laughs> like, breakout room, post a question, <laughs> slide share, go back. <laughs> oh my God. Uh, I think I got it. So, <laughs> all right, I'm going to open up the breakout rooms and we'll roughly 12 minutes. My 12 minutes and more like 14 minutes. But... Fun.
Uh oh. You know what? Let me see. Uh -oh. Okay, we've got about five minutes left and I'm gonna turn it over to Brian, facilitate the last five minutes. Well, uh, uh, Heather got cut off in her sentence and so she said she would be leaving some feedback for you on that. Uh, <laughs> well, I, I wanna leave with, <laughs> I wanna leave with um, perhaps the next challenge maybe because we didn't, we, we wanted to get into this, but we know this question could be its own hour and 15 minutes conversation. And that's this question about cost. And, and what's the cost model for open going forward? Um, I am all for not concentrating the profit margins into the hands of two or three companies um, and having all of us just be consumers of that. Um, but to, to, to the extent that there's a cost factor associated with codifying materials in a particular way, even if it's not in a textbook that's 900 pages, even if it's on a website that somebody's paying for the bandwidth, that somebody's you know, um, writing the publication, somebody's putting together the narrative of a, a ecosystem or a cell or whatever it is. Mm -hmm. um, so that cost might be labor. Um, one of the things I think we wanna take up in Rios as a challenge is, is, is having a better articulation of these models. And I know Karen, maybe Arlo, I'm sure your groups have been thinking about this for some time. Um, but well, you, you shake your head. I would love I would love to hear your thoughts on that a little bit. But, I don't have any answers, but yeah, yeah. we can have questions. But. <laughs> okay. but but I think that that might be one of our next big challenges as this continues to become a bigger movement. Um, any thoughts on that point quickly, um, or anything else that was said as we say goodbye in three minutes? Yeah, I mean, I will add that there's a lot of, oh, Maha, I think you were trying to speak. No, I wasn't, just noise in my kitchen. <laughs> okay, all right. <laughs> I was just gonna say along the lines of like, you know, how to put, there's a lot of a question about like press books and how many platforms, how are we gonna put this stuff out there? And should it just be a couple of companies? And I think the decentralized model makes the most sense whenever you wanna not concentrate power in the hands of the few. And that makes it messy and tricky and harder to find. And, you know, maybe messy and tricky and harder to find is a preferable world to a few companies getting a hold of everything and, eventually just gouging people for profit so i don't know those are our if those are our choices mm -hmm. um protocols not platforms yeah laura, laura probably has some things to say about that too well I, I what jonathan said exactly and and i'm a, been using blogs and rss for a long time but i just cannot say enough good things about rss as a tool that lets you knit things together from different sources so earlier in the chat i'd said that my students chose their own blog platforms and my only limitation on that was it needs to have rss so i can get us all connected so i know that's very old school but i had to put in that pitch yeah and can you create something great can somebody find it i mean that ultimate question of the librarian I know we're about running out of time. I just wanted to make sure I took the time to just really thank my friend and colleague, Brian, for agreeing to do this with me. He's so amazing and brilliant. And I'm so glad I got to work with him on this. And to thank all of you for being here and sticking it out through three sessions of our track. In some ways that went like, it wasn't enough. Like we could do like 10 more sessions and still have a lot more to talk about. Um, but I thank Maha for give, the generosity of giving us these three sessions of our track and allowing us space in the in the MyFest world. Oh, so no, it's your generosity. It was your generosity. Uh, honestly, some people signed up for MyFest just for this, and it was worth it. Uh, it was not enough, but it was a lot. And uh, it's been a privilege and honor and a pleasure. And I'm sure these mm -hmm. conversations won't stop, even though these sessions are stopping, right? So, yeah, and I'd, I'd also like to say thank you as well. Um, uh, my first my fest, and it's been great. 
Um, it's the I, first my first ever so yeah oh, for real oh, okay I, I, don't know why, I don't know why I assume. <laughs> you ever heard of a three-month conference before this is what we're <laughs> well i'm glad i was part i'm glad i was part of the initial right um you know one of the things i think a common theme that will karen and i were pushing is this this sort of need to talk to others expand have difficult dialogues but as Karen mentioned in the last session though, it's also very, very, very important to have spaces where you can commiserate, where you can feel like you're with your tribe um, and that those spaces give you strength. They give you, they remind you, they reaffirm you. And I felt that this week, I felt that reaffirmation, but I also felt like I learned new things. Um, I wanna say really quickly, I have to go click on a Zoom link in a second here that um, Karen and I through Rios will be working on a lot of some of the things we raised this week about open. Um, we're not kind of pitching this as this is sort of the, the grand answer that will solve everything. It's, it's yeah, certainly has solved a lot of problems we think, but we also recognize places where questions still need to be asked. And part of the discipline of doing this work is being active in addressing those questions and not, not relaxing and saying, oh, we figured it out, we can stop now. So we have a year long project, you know, looking at where, it, where open has been helpful, but where it still needs to kind of figure some things out and how do people like us continue to work towards um, uh, figuring those things out. So I invite you to join the Rios community. Um, I think there's a link somewhere, Karen. I just uh, right, yeah, posted it. We're like such a duo here. Um, <laughs> and, and so that you can just kind of stay up with us as we work on those things. And have again, a great evening, everyone. We're not selling anything. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, everybody. Feel free to stay in touch. You have our emails. You can find us through the Rios website or just Googling and happy to answer questions and stay in contact with any and all of you. Um, so take care. Thank you.